and talk about the family context of child OCD and how this is relevant for treatment. The primary way it's relevant is in terms of family accommodation and, and the goal is to, uh, of treatment is to reduce an accommodation of symptoms really by trying to um, foster kind of a, uh, the, getting the family members to disengage from the child's OCD to really foster um, the exposure treatment. And, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about sequencing different, um, how some guidelines, potential guidelines for sequencing uh, psych, uh, CBT and medication and, and selecting treatments. So treatments for child OCD typically don't lead to symptom remission. Even though we really have really great treatments for the most part that have led to, to pretty good response rates in terms of, of significant clinical response, when you look at um, the proportion of kids that actually would be considered as relatively symptom-free or, or non-clinical, the rates are still pretty low. So this is from the POTS um, study that compared um, CBT, sertraline, CBT plus sertraline, and pill placebo. At the end of acute treatment, 80% of kids that received sertraline only were still had clinically significant symptoms. 61% um, of kids that received CBT only still had clinically significant symptoms. And combined treatment, kids that got medication plus CBT still had 46%, uh, 46, and 46 of them still had clinically significant symptoms. The actual response rates were much higher, but these are kids that would be considered nearly symptom free. So these, there's still a lot of work left to be done. So when we think about how we might enhance our outcomes um, for, for CBT outcomes, we can look at predictors of CBT response. And the literature isn't that great. There haven't been a lot of controlled studies, but there have been a few studies for adults and for children. So adult studies have um, indicated a number of factors, including some family factors, as predicting worse response. And in the child literature, there also are a number of studies, again, mostly open trials or very small studies, that have um, implicated family factors, uh, certain family factors as predicting a worse outcome to, uh, to treatment. So family environment may be an important target for intervention if we're going to enhance uh, outcomes of the existing treatments. So when we think about family factors in childhood OCD, you see very high rates of family distress and dysfunction, elevated rates of parental OCD, which isn't surprising given that OCD is a genetic disorder, elevated rates of parental blame, or family members blaming their child for the OCD, um, endorsing items such as, I think my child is doing his OCD on purpose to make me mad, I get angry at my child instead of his or her OCD, um, and the like. We find higher rates of expressed emotion in families of kids with OCD, very high rates of family accommodation, um, and very high rates of family members actually participating in the child's OCD rituals. So family accommodation, which is defined as basically either participating in the child's rituals, by family members participating in the child's rituals, the family changing the family structure or the family environment to accommodate the child's symptoms. So for example, um, um, changing meal times or kind of bathing or grooming habits or their activity levels in terms of not going out because of the family's OCD, not a child's OCD, not inviting people over and the like, or, or otherwise giving in to the child's symptoms. So a child with contamination fears, family members, the mom typically might have to do extra washing or cleaning to um, placate the child or have to do other kinds of rituals, bedtime rituals or other kinds of rituals to um, give in to the child's OCD. This is really um, antithetical or a barrier to avoidance treatment because it really undermines um, exposure-based exercises and it really reinforces avoidance behaviors. So it's, it's a, an obvious target for intervention. So there have been a couple of studies looking at accommodation. Um, Calva Caressi and their colleagues documented high rates of accommodation and they showed that um, accommodation, so when families do give in to the child's symptoms or modify their routines, in response to the child's OCD, this is associated with increased levels of family distress. Amir also found that modification of the family routine in response to OCD is linked with higher rates of depression in caretakers, but interestingly, refusal to accommodate or attempts to disengage from the child is linked to higher levels of anxiety. So in some ways, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you give in, you feel bad. If you don't give in, you feel bad. So this is an important thing to take into account when we're considering um, uh, treatment for the child. 
and also accommodation was not linked to the severity of the child's OCD in the Amir study. But I think the Storch study is the most interesting of all, and this um, really resonates clinically when we're, when we're looking at the kids. So Storch, they looked at the relationship between OCD symptom severity and functional impairment, assuming that children with more severe OCD would, ha would have higher levels of, of functional impairment. And for parents, they found that this relationship held true. For kids, they didn't. According to Child Report, there was no relationship between their severity and their impairment. And what they found was the relationship was instead mediated by the level of functional impairment, the extent to which the, the parents gave in to the child's OCD. And this makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, basically what the kids were saying, yeah, I have OCD, but it's not causing me any problems because my mom does whatever I tell her to do with my OCD. It's not a problem because mom basically lets me take two-hour showers because mom washes all my clothes three times because mom stays up with me until 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm trying to finish my homework, because mom reassures me every time when I go to bed. There's no functional impairment. Everything is fine because mom makes it all better. And then you talk to the mom, and the mom is saying, oh, God, this is like, <laughs> this is really difficult. I mean, I'm doing all this stuff for the child, and, and it's really to be very difficult. So children, when they come in and, they, and you're doing the evaluation with them, and they say, my OCD really doesn't get in the way. Yeah, I have to wash my hands a lot, but it's really not a big problem. The first thing to think about is, is it because the family is accommodating, the family is giving in to the child's OCD and supporting the child's OCD? And if so, that really needs to be an important topic of, of, of treatment, focus of treatment. So there, there this is some data from our clinic, a study by Tara Paris and, um, in uh, 2008 that demonstrated high rates of accommodation in families of children with OCD. This was a sample of about 60 children in OCD seen in our clinic. So you can see very high rates of um, uh, parents report um, reassuring their children, um, frequently 85% of them in a given week. 60% participate in the child's rituals in a given week. Children, 80% of them will report becoming distressed or anxious when the, um, their, the family members don't accommodate. This is a parental report. Parents report that 80% of the time that they don't report, their children will become distressed or anxious. And about half the time, the children will become angry or abusive in response to the family not accommodating the OCD. About two-thirds report at least some degree of modification of the family routine. And this last slide is a typo. It should be distress when OCD accommodated. So three-quarters of the parents report that when they do accommodate or give in to their child's OCD, they feel um, distressed or upset about it. So this is we need to think about this again when we're doing treatment. So we also want to look at the correlates of accommodation. And again, this is the same paper. We found that. Um, more severe OCD on the part of the child led to higher levels of family accommodation. So not surprisingly, the, the sicker the child is, the more that impacts family functioning. Kids with comorbid behavior problems required greater family modification and responded worse to OCD limit setting. Again, this isn't surprising. If you have an aggressive child or a child with other behavior problems, they're going to resist disengagement to a much greater extent and they're going to act out negatively when the family doesn't facilitate their OCD. So when we're talking to parents in treatment about saying, you need to disengage from your child's OCD, we want to tease apart the parent involvement from the OCD to really facilitate full, full response prevention. Kids with comorbid behavior problems are going to act out potentially in a very negative way. So we need to be sensitive to this in, in treatment. We found that, that accommodation tends to be exacerbated in high conflict families. So families where there is more, more conflict report greater distress when they accommodate and worse consequences when they don't. And again, in a supercharged, negatively supercharged environment, trying to disengage from the child over the OCD, not surprisingly, is going to lead to more problems. So this really argues that lessening family conflict is an important goal of treatment. If we can, if we can reduce conflict, we're gonna, it might be easier to um, facilitate disengagement of the parents from the child's symptoms. And family accommodation and cohesion, so cohesion is kind of the flip side of conflict. Cohesive families are those that think together, do things together, consider themselves more kind of unified and on the same page as a family. Um, families that describe themselves as being more cohesive have an easier time in terms of disengaging from the child's OCD and reducing their accommodation. So again, enhancing family relations um, may also facilitate more positive response to treatment. We also found that more organized families, families that describe themselves as more organized, 
reported an easier time of, of facilitating disengagement from the child's symptoms. So enhancing family structure may also facilitate a more positive response to treatment. And then finally, we found that um, parents who have significant levels of OCD symptoms have a more difficult time disengaging from the kids. Parental OCD is associated with less family organization, more negative consequences of limit setting, and greater distress when limit setting. So addressing parental OCD may also serve to facilitate a more positive outcome for the child's OCD. So when we're asking families of OCD kids to resist accommodating their symptoms as part of treatment, typically that's going to result in either emotional distress on the part of the family or negative reactions on the part of the child. And especially in distressed families, or families or kids that are more complicated in terms of psychopathology and family relationships, these negative responses are going to be magnified, um, which really, again, is difficult for treatment. So when we think about family-based treatments, the first thing we want to do is clarify a family-based treatment versus an individual-based treatment. So individual child plus family-based interventions typically specify, or family, family CBT is typically defined as individual child plus family interventions, which are specifically structured, occur weekly, and are really focused on changing family dynamics versus an individual treatment, which, really, which may include family members, but typically do so in a less structured or less frequent manner. So perhaps as a brief check-in at the end of individual sessions or involvement in certain exposure and response prevention activities. So when we think about family interventions, um, there are a number of goals that we want to achieve. The first is to reduce levels of conflict and feelings of anger, blame, and guilt and enhance family cohesion, since these have all been shown to, um, to impact the degree to which families are able to disengage from the kids. Enhance family problem solving and co coping and affect regulation in a way to, again, foster more appropriate um, disengagement from the child's symptoms and also to try to resolve the conflicts that may arise from this disengagement in a more, um, in a more positive manner. Facilitate this disengagement then, so by, by these, uh, doing these other things about re reducing the, the negative feelings and enhancing problem solving, we hope to then facilitate disengagement from the family's symptoms we also want to use the family intervention to rebuild kind of OCD family interaction patterns. So a child with OCD in the family can really s serve to distort family roles and family functions in, 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 in potentially troublesome ways. So as the OCD gets better, sometimes we need to kind of reestablish kind of family relations or family roles in a way that um, will then help maintain the gains that we've been able to achieve. And then really try to minimize distress at home and, and create more family organization in ways that are going to be conducive to maintaining treatment gains. So in the treatment program I've been describing, we have 12 sessions that are manualized um, directly associated with these goals, with the family treatment goals. Uh, the first is an information gathering and psychoeducation and the symptom heart hierarchy and psychoeducation that I had described earlier. Um, the parents and child are involved in these sessions. The third session, we really want to talk about negative attributions about the child and about the child's OCD. And this is typically sessions that are held without the child present, but family members are given an opportunity to vent, talk about the child, how difficult it is having a child with OCD. Um, we, uh, the therapist will talk to the parents about different kinds of misattributions or attitudes or ideas that they have. So for example, families with um, increased levels of, of blame who blame the child for the OCD feel the behaviors are purposeful, for example, um, we can use psychoeducation to try to, to, to correct some of these, these misattributions. Same thing with the fourth session is really a continuation of addressing these negative attributions and attitudes and also addressing blame reduction. So a lot of times families will come in and they'll blame themselves for the child's OCD, either recognizing that OCD is a genetic disorder or maybe attributing the OCD to different kinds of, of, of factors in the environment, such as um, the way they, they raise the kids. I had one um, mother who, after all the psychoeducation, then we talked to her, she um, burst into tears and said, I know the OCD is all my fault because I put my child in timeout. And she thought putting the child in timeout led to the OCD, which was, which was false. So a lot of times there's going to be a lot of supportive work with the families to try to, try to address some of these, these concerns. We also talk about the spectrum of family response, how it can go from complete engagement or um, with, with family accommodation and enmeshment in the child's symptoms. So this would be a family where the child rules the roost 
and the family members are at the child's kind of beck and call in some ways. The child can take showers as long as he or she wants. The parents have to engage in all the rituals and do all the cleaning for the child. And the child is excused from normal responsibilities or chores because of the OCD. To the opposite end of the spectrum, which is complete disengagement from the child and, um, or, or very negative, um, negative responses to the child's OCD, um, anger and hostility. And talking about the ideal point is going to be somewhere in the middle where the family is available to support the child and facilitate their, their um, involvement in games and treatment. We also talk about the child's responsibility for treatment in his or her illness. So we will talk about OCD as a sense that the child may not be able to control his or her symptoms yet. That will be the goal of treatment. But if the child has a contamination fear that is, that is, a contamination fear that is so severe that it really, if he is unable to engage in um, response prevention at this point, the family may need to continue to accommodate that symptom at some level um, until, that, until that symptom is addressed on the hierarchy. But that doesn't mean that the child is not responsible for the consequences of this behavior. So for example, we've had families that say the child couldn't get ready in time or the child was afraid of contamination, so we couldn't go out to dinner at our favorite restaurant. We like to go out to dinner once a week, but Billy's OCD got to the point where we all had to stay home. Again, part of the child's responsibility for his or her OCD would be that the other family members could go out to dinner, or maybe mom or dad could take the other children out to dinner and Billy would stay home. So in other words, we're not blaming Billy for not being able to go out to dinner, but nor should, nor should the brothers and sisters or other family members also have to suffer because of Billy's, Billy's OCD. Um, we then move on and, and address treatment barriers, and one of the barriers is secondary gain. And we found that in some families, um, the children accrue a lot of attention as a result of their OCD, either parental attention or other kinds of attention. Um, they also are able to, um, have, are, are freed from having to do certain chores around the house or other things around the house or their homework because of the OCD, which can serve as a secondary gain to reinforce the symptoms. Again, this isn't necessarily a conscious process, um, but from, from learning theory, um, you know, anything that's going to, to, to lead to desired outcomes may be reinforced in one way or another. So the secondary gain of, of being able to take two hour showers, of being able to go to school late, of being able to stay up late, whatever that might be, really does need to be addressed in treatment and using behavioral strategies to try to change the reinforcement contingencies associated with the child's OCD. The other factor, and this is something that's pretty important, is differentiating OCD from non-OCD behaviors. So we've had cases where, um, and, and quite commonly, well, the parents will come in and say, you know, Billy does certain things and he doesn't do other things and we don't know if because it's his OCD or, or not. And so we're afraid to, to intervene. So there was one case that we worked with of a boy that um, had contamination fears uh, related and he, and he had, a, and he had a, a baby brother, an 18 month old baby brother and the parents wanted him to babysit his, his brother so they could go out. They could get out and, and go out to dinner you know, once a week or once a month or whatever. And he refused to do that. He said he didn't want to do that because it was his OCD. He was afraid of contamination. He also had chores around the house. One of his chores was he had to set the table every night before dinner because both parents worked and that was the timing such that, that they needed him to set the table. He also refused to do that. And they weren't sure whether these were related to the contamination fears or to other factors. And um, he was able to say in session, you know, when we talked to, and I talked to him, he said, I don't want to babysit my brother because I'm afraid of contaminating him and then he'll get sick or die. That was clearly OCD related. He said, but in terms of setting the table, he goes, no, I have my favorite TV shows on at that time, so I just don't want to set the table because I'd rather watch TV. That wasn't OCD related. So we were able to clarify these and address both symptoms. So setting the table then was immediately reinstated and a, and a reward program was set up for him to set the table. And babysitting the brother, he was allowed to not babysit the brother, to continue not doing that for a period of time, but that went on his symptom hierarchy as part of his contamination exposures. And once we reached that symptom on the hierarchy, his part of his treatment was that he was to babysit his brother. And, um, you know, parents kind of get really confused, you know, well, my child is like, uh, 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 needs everything ordered or everything arranged in certain ways, yet his room is a mess. You know, is that OCD or not? You know, well, Billy, you know, there are certain things that he can't do but he never does his homework. Is that OCD or not? And so it really can be difficult. So we really want to try to disengage or disentangle what is OCD related from, from what isn't OCD related so that we can address these things appropriately. 
The other thing we want to talk about in family treatment is family well-being and support. It can be tremendously burdensome for some families to have a child with OCD. And it can be almost all time consuming. And, and the, we really see a lot of parents that are quite run down um, and, and really burn out in a lot of ways. So the key to success with treatment for the child and the key for maintaining these gains is going to be to have a healthy family. So we really want to talk to the family members about what they can do to take care of themselves and do things like prescribing time away from home, like nights out for the parents, for example, or other fun act activities for the kids in a way to really kind of remove some of the focus that, that in a lot of times the families are distorted in the sense that all the focus, all the attention, and all the activities revolve around the child with OCD. And we really want to redistribute activities and control in the family more evenly across family members or more appropriately to parents and, and, and children as, as um, depending on the situation. So that's another important factor. And then the last couple of sessions are really focused on problem review, problem solving, general problem solving skills, both related to OCD and other factors that may arise that may lead to stress in the house. And then finally talking about relapse prevention in terms of being able to recognize um, OCD when OCD um, again may, um, symptoms may return or may intensify what the family should do and to maintain a lot of the, the gains in the family dynamics, for example, trying to can maintain more organized, more cohesive, and reduce some of the negative factors that we see at home and really try to focus on these factors and try to set up a family environment that's going to be, again, supportive to the child maintaining treatment gains. So that's kind of the family intervention in a nutshell, and obviously it's going to vary by family. We've had some families that come in that are, that are very healthy, very appropriate, really don't fit any of these problems that I've described, in which case we, we're going to probably go over these, these um, topics as well in case things do change in the future. We have other families that have come in that have been very, very dysfunctional, very troubled, um, and um, we really do need to spend more time or even more intensive intervention than, than I've described here. Um, but but I, think, I think in my opinion, my clinical experience, it really is important to involve the families in treatment in some kind of a systematic way um, in almost all cases. Sometimes you have older adolescents that don't want the families involved. And again, then you need to weigh kind of the adolescent's autonomy versus family involvement. And that can be, um, you know, that, that just has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But some level of family involvement, I think, is, is quite important. The other thing that I think this speaks to is um, the extent to which we want family members engaged in the child's treatment. So some treatments talk about family, um, family like parents as an adjunct therapist, um, really actively involved in supervising, implementing, monitoring, and supervising the child's exposure exercises at home. And I guess this really needs to be done on an individual basis as also. In families that are healthy families in which the OCD hasn't led to significant um, conflict or, or difficulty among the family, um, and which there's not a lot of accommodation, it may be appropriate for a parent to take that role. But we really negotiate that with the child and with the parent. Um, if the child says, I don't want my mom involved in my, in my treatment or my exposure exercises, typically what we'll say is, okay, that's really great. Let's try it for a week and see how it works. And if you can do it on your own, that's great. We won't need mom involved. But if it's hard for you to do the, the homework the way we've talked about, then we can talk again about maybe mom can help you in some way. So we always give the kid the benefit of the doubt first, but we always keep the backup plan um, close, at, close at hand. Um, in on other situations, if there is a lot of recrimination or a lot of high levels of conflict or blame or accommodation, these factors, that, again, we've shown that can have a negative impact on treatment, we're going to be less likely to involve that parent in, in treatment because what happens then, you get this power struggle superimposed on treatment. And it may, the, the, the treatment may, may be distorted or subsumed by, by this ongoing power struggle which is really going to make it less likely that the child is going to do the treatment as we like, or that it's going to become really um, associated with these other negative, negative factors of the, of the kid's environment. And then um, review and termination to try to really review everything in treatment, um, really focus on the positive gains that the child has made, and really make sure that the family and child can go out knowing that they have um, a good sense of, of, of how treatment works, of what to do in different situations, and how to really try to maintain their gains. And there was a question? Along with these, you're doing this each session? Each session. So you're doing this plus you're doing the exposure? Yeah, so, so the, way, the way that, the, excuse me, the, way that the, um, the treatment works, I mean, ideally, of course, you're going to be very flexible, but um, when, we've used, when we used the treatment in the study that we did, what we did is we had 12 sessions, individual sessions, and that was, those were about an hour long for the kids. 
And um, the parents were involved in the first two sessions, you know, during the psychoeducation and developing the fear hierarchy. And then um, the child had individual sessions, and then we had 20 to 30 minute parent sessions at the end of each session. So if, we're gonna, if you're gonna really give them the full dose of the treatment, you're gonna have the sessions were about 80 to 90 minutes. And it was 12 sessions over 14 weeks. Now in a clinical, if you're using this clinically, of course you have much more flexibility. So sometimes what we do in our clinic when we're not able to do 90 minute sessions, we may intersperse child and parent sessions. We may see the child for two or three sessions, then we'll have a parent session and maybe we'll combine a couple of these. Of these, um, you know, Since we can't do 12 parent sessions, maybe we can only do four or six, we'll combine the topics and compress them in and maybe do a one hour, four one hour sessions instead of like 12, 12, 20 or 30 minute sessions. And the child is involved in some of the parent sessions um, depending on the topic. Um, we almost always, though, in the child's individual session, we do want to check in with the mom or dad or the parent at the beginning of treatment, at the beginning of the session to see how things were going. And then we usually bring the parent in for the last few minutes of the child's session and have the child demonstrate what they were working on, demonstrate their gains. They can show mom or dad you know, what a great job they've been doing in treatment. And then we also, when we talk about homework or planned homework, we want the parent to know what the child's assignments were. Even if the child, um, the parent isn't going to be directly involved in the homework, we, we still want the parent to have some sense of what's going on. For an, for an adolescent or an older adolescent, we may, there may be less parental involvement. We may not involve the parent in the treatment to that extent. We may not talk about the homework assignments with the parent unless, the, unless we're having compliance problems with the child. So again, it's, again it can be much more, it's really much more flexible to, to the specific needs of, of the individual patient and, and his or her family. Anything else on that? Yes. In instances where you involve the, just the child because of, let's say, it's ICBT and the other conditions, parenting, and you can't do parenting in ICBT and all that, but you notice that there is like a blaming and criticism, and you bring the parent a couple of times to review progress, and yet they say, oh yeah, all this is great, but you know, there's always like uh, things like that. How do you, how do you, um, what do you do with a child to change maybe perhaps some of the the, yeah, the, stuff, the parenting stuff without directly having to? Well, you need to. That the, the parenting is interfering with, with. If we think the parenting is interfering, we're going to want to bring the parents in and address it and, and meet with the parents and, and, and work with them to try to, to try to fix these problems. It's not always possible. I mean, sometimes the parents will refuse or won't want to come in. But. Um, if we really think that it's interfering, I mean, we will, we will really tell the parents, you know, you need to come in and address these things because right now, we don't think the individual treat the individual treatment isn't going to work, unless we unless we address these other problems. So we're not going to keep working with the child if we know that it, if we know that it's doomed to fail because of what's going on in the home with the parents. Because and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because the the um, the child is going to get a negative, the child and parents are going to get a negative sense of treatment. Well, I went through this whole treatment and it didn't work, so CBT doesn't work. CBT is a bad treatment. And that's not the case. CBT is a good treatment, but the parents, but everybody needs to do their part in, in the treatment. And, if, and if, it's, if it's futile, then it really can be very frustrating or upsetting to the child that, that they're doing all this work and they're not getting better. So we will actually, um, I mean, I think, what, I think what you need to do if there's something going on that is directly interfering with the potential efficacy of the treatment, we would basically tell the parents, you know, we, we're gonna, we're, you need to come in, we need to talk about this, because, we're, because the, the, child, the work with the child is really, um, it's not working as well as we'd like because of these other factors, we think because of these other factors that we see at home. And so we're not gonna continue doing the work with the child until we can address these other factors because it's, it's, it's a waste of time to do that. So we'll, re we'll really draw the line and the parents need to come in and, addre and address this um, before we will continue to do the work with the child. That doesn't mean we're gonna drop the child. Um, we may still meet with the child and do, and do some other kinds of things, but, we, but we'll stop doing the exposure treatment because it's, all we're, all we're doing is, is we're, we're sabotaging the treatments and we, and we don't wanna propagate that going on. So, I mean, it's easy, it's hard to do. Some parents just aren't willing to do the work or aren't willing to come in or aren't willing, I should say, or sometimes it's not that they're not willing, sometimes they're unable. They're just unable to change. So we really need to, uh, to address that um, to the best that we can. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. 
So um, just in terms of the family, the other thing that we've, we've done is um, one of the um, junior faculty in our program, Tara Paris, has, has developed a more intensive family intervention program called, posit um, called PFIT, um, Positive Family um, Interaction Therapy. And it really is a very kind of intensive kind of affect regulation based intervention designed for these really dysfunctional families of kids with OCD. And um, it's a six session treatment right now. Um, she's just doing some pilot work with it that really, I mean, really is very kind of an intense intervention with the parents to really get them to change these, these dysfunctional interactions with the kids. And a lot of that really is, is doing therapy with the parents to try to help them deal with some of these the, their, own, their own affect related to the child with OCD and, and to, uh, to disengaging from the symptoms. And we're hoping that that will be, that treatment certainly isn't for, for every patient. It really is designed to address parents in which, which there are significantly high levels of family dysfunction. So it may be that, that kind of the parenting piece that I've just described um, may, be, may be helpful for kind of the middle of the road families that... Um, that you know everybody can get some level of family intervention, but for the for the families, it really some families do require uh, significantly more intensive intervention, and so the idea would be that we would have varying degrees of family intervention that we could then assign prescriptively depending on the need or the specifics of the family. Let's talk about strategies for selecting and combining and sequencing treatments, and I want to caution you that this is kind of a collection of clinical observation um, from myself and from others. I think it reflects probably the general feeling within the field, but um, this isn't evidence-based. There, there haven't been studies, a large-scale studies, to examine these questions, and these questions are sorely needed. So this is really a collection of kind of clinical vignettes, so I think we need to be careful in terms of how we, how we interpret or talk about these data. So in terms of, of selecting an initial treatment strategy, we know that both CBT and certain kinds of, of, of medication are reasonably effective and well-tolerated treatments for childhood OCD. We also know from the literature that CBT is associated with, with somewhat higher response rates than medication, um, greater levels of symptom reduction, and potentially more durable treatment gains, although really durability has not been, has not been well studied in children with OCD, it really, this has really been more inferred from the adult literature. So this all, but given the safety profile and the potentially more durable treatment gains, the um, guidelines are that CBT should be the first line of treatment for, for children and adolescents with CBT. Now the expert consensus guidelines, which were based on a review and a survey of expert, expert clinicians and researchers in pediatric OCD, um, came up with these following suggestions that CBT should be the first line treatment in all prepubertal children, but for adolescents, CBT should be the first line treatment for mild to moderate OCD, and CBT in combination with medication should be the first line treatment for severe OCD. And I think most people believe this and follow this, but I would really caution you that these are not based on empirical evidence. There's no empirical evidence that CBT plus medication should be the first line treatment for severe OCD nor is there any evidence that the guidelines should be different for prepubertal children versus adolescents. So this is again is kind of more of a clinical observation. So I think the general strategy should be that CBT really is kind of the first line approach because of the safety profile. Um, you know, there are side effects associated with medication. CBT is certainly a safer treatment and the demonstrated um, um, efficacy, you know, it's, it's more efficacious in medication. If you look at across the body of literature, and likely more durable than medication as well. So for that case, CBT really is the first line approach in, in most cases. But there may be some situations in which you might want to start with medication first. And you might want to consider medication in the following circumstances. When anxiety is too high for CBT. So if the child is so anxious or the OCD is so severe that you can't find a starting point. You can't come up with an exposure that is, that it, you can't come up with a symptom that you can expose that the child will be able to be, be able to do. So in the case of no matter what symptom it is, it tells us there's no way I'm going to do that exposure. I can't do that exposure. Even after, even after doing work with the child in terms of psychoeducation and anxiety management and cognitive restructuring, there's no symptom that the child is willing to do exposure with. In the presence of significant functional impairment. So medication, um, the data suggests that medication may have a, a quicker initial response. 
the, the, ultimate, the ultimate response may not be as great as medication, but the, there may be a more of an initial, the initial response may be quicker. So a child that's not attending school or a child that is having other kinds of very severe functional impairments, it may make sense to start with medication in the in hope of getting a maybe a slightly, slightly higher, um, slightly quicker initial response that will allow the child to again um, reintegrate into school or, or with other kind of functional, functional um, demands. Medication should also be considered in the presence of significant comorbid symptoms. So for example, in a child that has very severe comorbid depression um, and anxiety, um, you might want to consider a medication given that the medications used for, for OCD also have impact on, on depression. Alternatively, behavioral treatments for, for depression or CBT for depression could also be considered in this regard. Or in terms of, of, of significant ADHD that's going to interfere with the child's ability to benefit from to benefit from OCD. If the child can't pay attention long enough to really engage in the treatment, um, it might make sense to consider can medication for the ADHD or potentially behavioral treatment for the ADHD to start with um, before we start the exposure-based treatment. And also in the presence of significant barriers to compliance with CBT. CBT takes some amount of time and there is some wor work required out of session. And We have had families that come in and say, you know what, there's just we don't, we don't, it doesn't matter how important this is, we just don't have the time or the ability to do the work that we need to do to um, do the CBT. Or the child refuses, says, I'm not doing CBT, I'm not doing exposure. Or the parent, uh, <coughs> the parent um, preferences for medication. We've actually had physicians that have come in and said, we don't want CBT, we only want medication. And we will, we will never necessarily accept that at face value right off the bat. We will, we will want to do some psychoed with the family and talk to them about both treatments and the merits and benefits of both treatments. But in some situations, if the family really says, we just want medication to start with, we, we, we in our clinic, we, we may start with the medication. And then finally, when quality CBT is unavailable. I mean, CBT is, I think, is the best treatment, at least the best initial treatment. But sometimes if it's not available, medication may be better than no treatment at all. If we do start with medication or if we prescribe medication, again, in our, the psychiatrists in our program start with medication, um, we always consider the medication as an initial point um, and its use of medication will be to get to the child to a point where we can then initiate CBT. Um, very rarely would we recommend medication as the only treatment or as a standalone treatment. Um, instead of CBT. So, so those might be conditions under which you would consider medication for a child. Again, it's very done on a very much of an individual basis. And again, again, we would almost always consider CBT for a child if, if we think at all possible that the child will be able to engage in the CBT. When might you add medication to CBT? So given that CBT is the first line treatment in, in most cases, in the vast majority of cases, sometimes there comes to a point where we may not be seeing the gains that we want and we would consider adding medication is an adjunct, and that would be um, if we basically just aren't getting the, aren't getting after several weeks. We typically would want to go at least probably eight weeks of CBT of quality CBT, including at least four to six weeks of exposure of, of quality exposure. And if we're not getting any response at that point, we might consider adding medication. Um, if the family's motivation for CBT or, or patient motivation really is flagging, they say, I just don't want to do this anymore, and they really start giving up on the CBT or become very non-compliant, we might consider adding medication. Um, if there's a significant um, um, increase in symptom severity or a significant negative change in functional impairment, the kid stops going to school um, or other factors such as that where we think would interfere with the CBT, we might also consider adding medication at that point, just given the fact that the medication might lead to a, uh, to a faster um, initial response. Discontinuing medication, there are no empirical guidelines. Um, discontinuation in absence of CBT is associated with an elevated risk of relapse. So typically, if you take the medication away, the OCD symptoms come back. So the uh, recommendations are, are never just to stop medication for no reason or in the absence of CBT. But if you are going to stop medication, um, it typically what, it would be a very slow um, reduction of the dose associated with, with CBT. So the feeling being that um, as the medication is decreased and symptoms start to come back, you're there with CBT to really, to really try to address these symptoms and teach the child strategies for managing the OCD. And um, by the time that the medication is done, the CBT should be in full bloom, and that would give the child, again, strategies and, and, and hopefully protect against 
significant relapse. But that has to be done on a very gradual basis. Discontinuing CBT. Um, there are no empirically based guidelines for this. Some of the treatment studies include booster sessions. A lot of them don't. Um, but typically, kids get 12 to 14 weeks of CBT or whatever CBT that it takes, and then, and then they're stopped. And um, nobody's really looked too much to see, to see what happened. There's, um, based on the adult literature and just some of the suggestive child literature, there seems to be a lower risk of relapse than medication. So if you discontinue CBT, kids are more likely to maintain their gains. We also, in our clinic, we typically recommend more of a gradual taper. So in other words, in our treatment, they, they come weekly, and then as they're, getting, they're starting to get to the point of, of discontinuation, we'll, we'll, we'll have them go to every two weeks, and then every three weeks, and then maybe have them come back in a month. So really kind of a gradual taper. Um, boosters, I think uh, the recommendation would be to also do booster sessions, have the kids come back every three months or every few months, at least for the first year or so. Um, I think makes a lot of sense and would be very helpful. Now, a lot of people don't do this. Um, but what you tend to find sometimes is that kids, after they've stopped the treatment, they may stop doing the exercises. And you do find in some cases that the symptoms will start coming back or at the beginning of the school year or in times of stress, the symptoms may start coming back. And oftentimes it can be kind of insidious or gradual at first, um, but um, it can quickly, it can potentially balloon into a, a partial or full relapse at some point. So if you kind of continue to monitor the child and really kind of do booster sessions with the child over time, you're much more likely to catch if there are any of these kind of gradual return of symptoms to kind of nip those in the bud and just maintain, make sure that the child is practicing the techniques. And um, again, thank you. Yeah.